Hello, this is Ken Owen, a former journalist and longtime fan of the man formerly known as Keith Partridge. You're listening to the David Cassidy Connections with your great host, Louise Poynton. Hello, hello, everyone, and welcome to this week's episode of the David Cassidy Connections. Thank you for downloading this podcast. And if you have just found us, all previous episodes dating back to August 2020 can be found wherever you get your podcasts from. I am Louise Poynton, and today my guest is Dr. Quizler, who records covers of Partridge Family songs, as well as music by many other artists. He considers the Partridge Family garage as his happy place, and tells me how this all happened. Our conversation is peppered with sound bites of the covers he has recorded, but these and many more can be heard on his YouTube channel. Here is my conversation with a man who is also a self-confessed Doctor Who fan, Dr. Quizler. We are going to be talking today about compositions, arrangements, yeah? Okay. And why the earlier songs have been overlooked. Ah. Yeah. Tell me how and why this passion for covering Partridge Family songs happened. Well, I can only say that I was not an early adopter when the show first premiered. And mainly, I think that was probably because I um, was, you know, it's it's sort of like with Knight Rider. I was also not an early adopter of Knight Rider. And I can explain that one better. I I didn't allow myself to watch Knight Rider because I was I was concerned that I would be that I would be envious of that car that was just so cool. <laughs> Eventually I allowed myself to start watching it and it was fun on a level that went beyond thinking the car was cool because the car was a character on the show and it was fun watching all the interactions between you know, the guy kind of superhero played by Hasselhoff and the car superhero, Mm -hmm. you know, played by a combination of actual cars and William Daniels with that amazing voice, you know, voice over voice for being Kit, you know? Um, So it sort of was like that with the Partridge family too. Yes. I'm definitely coming back to that in that when the show started, there was a promo that Dave Madden did where he said, you know, we're we're doing this new show about this this fun, hip, cool musical family. So I was afraid as a little kid who was just learning uh, things like, okay, counting the alphabet, numbers, words, math, and piano, that I was going to be envious of all this fun these music kids were having on that show. I allowed myself to watch the show at some point after the first few episodes. And it was just fun. There are all kinds of fun that a TV show can be. And sometimes the fun is look look at how f- fashionable we are. Look at how, you know, wealthy and well-to-do we are. And the Partridge Family show was not like that. I mean, whether their real lives were like that or not is different. But the show itself was just fun. They were a nice, normal, middle-class family with a single parent who was a a widow. And there were these kids, you know? And they were, as as characters, extraordinarily musically talented. And they had these comic misadventures, which were fun to follow. And then the show had these song breaks because they were a band. So they'd go out to their garage. I know you guys say garage. I like saying that, too. Is it okay if I say garage? (laughs) Yes, you can say garage. Okay, or garage, even better. Garage. Garage is what we say with this emphasis on the latter syllable. Garage is what I've I've heard a lot of Brits say, you know, in various television (laughs) projects. (laughs) And And you're saying garage, which is even further away from garage <laughs> you know this garage of theirs this garage <laughs> was the scene of a lot of fun stuff happening you know a lot of behind the scenes music stuff where they're practicing these songs and whatnot it, it moved the story of this family along here we are having this stuff going on and now here we are working on this song here we are playing through this song that I just wrote. In the mythos of the show, he was the songwriter 
for practically every song they did, which of course, you know, IRL was anything but the truth. Mostly like uh, Wes Farrell, Tony Romeo, and whatever partners they could drag in from the, you know, various corners of, of music. Most notably to me, Money, Money. Money, Money was one. Well, they sing through the song, and this is the one time Lori isn't smiling as she's singing because she disapproves of the message that the, that the song sends. The whole time they're singing, she's like, mm-hmm. and then after, after they get through running it through, perfectly, by the way, on the first try, <laughs> yes. um, she tells him you know, that she doesn't really approve of this, this message of materialism as a, as a means of wooing a prospective date. So there was, this, there was this discussion, and it all took place still in the garage. Did you find that the garage was a happy place for you? <laughs> yeah. Oh, I've, I've, been known, I've been known to refer to the Partridge family garage as, as my happy place. Yes, indeed. Oh, yeah. The episode where Bobby Conway, played by Bobby Sherman, he breaks into the garage and he makes use of all their stuff to put together this demo of his song that he's been working on that's not really a song yet because he doesn't have words for it. So he's just got the instrumental stuff. Right? And it sounds great, you know, because apparently he plays every instrument they have and he's very familiar with, you know, the various recording, you know, multi-track techniques of the, of the time. The thing is, I mess around here with music on a on a really weird mythical level. I kind of like to think of myself as uh, as being virtually, you know, in that same position as Bobby Conway. Well, you know, I'm I've broken into the Partridge's garage and I'm messing around with their 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 equipment, their stuff, and I'm laying down tracks, you know, getting ready to put this demo together, etc. You know, it's fun. It's fun to look at it that way, even even if it's not a Partridge song or a, or a you know David Cassidy song per se. I also like their living room. Their living room had a piano that hardly ever got touched on the show, but still, there was potential there. <laughs> Do you consider the Partridge Family music underrated, underappreciated? outside of the fan base. Oh, yes, absolutely. No, no, it, it, it's, 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 um, it's kind of relegated to a sort of a bubblegum status, which is an easy thing to, an easy way to dismiss music without, without actually delving into it. The people who, who look at it that way or who look down at it in that way, I don't think they realize what they're missing. And I think they're missing a lot. Every time I mess around with one of their songs, I think it has been every time, I discover something that I that I didn't realize was there just from listening to it. Is that from the point of view of the arrangements or the way the song was written? Or maybe even the way in which David delivered the lyrics? All three of those things are in play, where um, there was something absolutely magical about that combination of their arrangements, you know, their, their songs that they would pick, um, and David is the lead guy. I, I, I can't believe, to this day, how they stumbled into, into such a gold mine. They could have picked anybody who looked good as a kind of passable hippie singer type. <laughs> but they, mm. they picked mm. that one guy who just happened to have that voice and that performing manner about him. Um, yeah, I, I guess that's probably what they saw. They saw, well, he looks good in what we imagine the role to be. He'd probably make a good Keith Partridge. He definitely looks the part. And I guess two or three episodes in, they were patting themselves on the back for, you know, having found the right guy. And then later, it turns out he's got this voice. (laughs) Yeah. And what a voice. Where do you rate his voice? Judging from what they actually had him doing, I think there might have been a bit of a limit. Like, he couldn't go, like, crazy high or, like, crazy low. But, you Mm. know, definitely a passable high tenor range. Definitely a passable high baritone range. I think we can pretty 
reasonably say uh, he attempted to plug himself into things that were that, that didn't really fit his voice type, and it felt like an ill fit. But if he had somebody in his corner who could write specifically for him and manage him, yeah, he needed mm-hmm. he needed somehow to be able to break out of it, and he didn't really have didn't he never really found the right vehicle. That's a shame. I mean, in a way, it, it's it's a version of what happens with a child star trying to um, trying to rebrand themselves, but still stuck with looking like the child star they had been. Your YouTube channel is just packed with these wonderful covers. I mean, you have done an exceptional job with these Aww. classic songs. Thank you. you. Really have. Thank you very much. Um, when you did your cover of Together, Having a Ball. Oh. Oh, I love that. What does that song mean to you? There were a lot of um, songs and artists, things from the radio and from television that uh, found their way into that soundtrack of mine. But the Partridge family was, was a really big factor as well. Maybe because of it being so early in my childhood. What I normally do when I post these things as I, as I, as I go, I allow myself to ramble in the... Um, in the descriptions. So I think I wrote a, I think I wrote a pretty good ramble about that. Basically um, what I did or, or how I saw it was I was thinking about how we were, um, we were all quarantining. This was two years ago, I guess. Everybody was like quarantined away from everybody else. So I was thinking about how at some point it'd be nice for us all to be together again. So there's that. Also, that was the theme song of the show for the first few episodes. And then they mm-hmm. came up with When We're Singing, which which later became Come On, Get Happy. And in the first, I think it was the first episode where they were struck with stage fright. They were singing their first big gig. And Shirley was like, <laughs> the mother hen, the mother partridge, you know, all right, come on, let's, let's, let's not, let's not worry about this. Let's just calm down. Let's zen out. Let's close our eyes. Let's make like we're back in the garage having fun. <laughs> and then they started just, just kind of working their way through the song. And then a few bars in, they're opening their eyes and they're okay with, you know, being surrounded by lights and mics and audience and all that. You know, I, I associate the song with that part of the show, that, that um, you know, the early, the early few episodes of the show. Everybody's going places, doing things. Look at all the smiling faces, see Having a ball, doing the number Having a ball, getting it all Together, together, together I'd like to highlight a couple of the um, earlier videos which featured miming but I think it's probably a good idea to explain what miming was all about because people are going to see that you know, in these earlier videos, like Umbrella Man and Summer Days, that there's miming going on. What's up with that is I actually got the idea from the Partridge, the Partridge Family playbook where, where that show and many other shows like you know The Monkees and American Bandstand featured pre-recorded music and simulated live performances. I decided early on I I wanted more happening in my videos than just basic piano controller stuff for every part. So uh, I decided to do what 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 these other these shows do, like the Partridge Family and mime. But my twist on miming was I wanted to use air instruments instead of doing what would have been easy, just go to a pawn shop and buy an old bass and mime bass playing on an old bass. To me, that would have felt inauthentic. I didn't play bass or guitar. I studied piano, a few woodwind instruments, and I played drums a lot as a kid. I got pretty good at miming drums accurately because I can just say, okay, the snare's here, the hi-hat's here, the cymbal's here. 
At a certain point, miming felt silly, and it was a lot of work to try and line up the part with what I had done on the actual track. So it occurred to me that I could just buy different types of MIDI controllers for different types of instruments. Use those, you know, for each part. So, you know, drum pad controller for drumming, guitar controller for bass and guitar, that sort of thing. Wind controller for flute and other wind parts. And it's actually a lot less work. So the later videos you'll see took a lot less work and are easier to sync. I class the non-David Cassidy songs and the David Cassidy songs differently. I think far and away, without even having to think about it, I think I'll Meet You Halfway is like my, my favorite DCPF song, David Cassidy, Partridge Family song. Mm-hmm. So simple, so elegant. And yeah. it's, got, it's got this nice, pure message to it. And the construction of the song is just 4-4, four, four, plain old stuff and good old C major. And in the video, Susan Day as Laurie, I didn't have a crush on her when I was a kid, because I was about um, Chris's age. Mm. Forrester. You interviewed him. Yeah, Brian. Brian Forrester. Brian Forrester. Right, right, right. Yes. I was, and I guess you could say I am (laughs) Mr. Forrester's age. (laughs) When that song came out, you know, I wasn't necessarily thinking, oh, she looks so lovely playing the piano. Since then, I've been like, man, she really looks cute playing the piano. (laughs) You know, and but now I'm too old for her. I'm too old for her at that age. (laughs) We've been traveling in circles such a long, long time. Try to say hello. Oh, Oh. we could just let it slide. But you're someone that I'd like to get to know. I'll meet you halfway. Better than no way. What do you think your